said to you, uh, I think I'll start with this, I think it's strange to be talking about the future of social care when we know the current outlook is so bleak. And um, I will spend a few moments talking about what you've just um, uh, done quite quickly, uh, so, because I think we need to understand that. Um, I want to talk about just why we now need to grasp this issue, we really do. Um, the recent report which you just mentioned, David, by the King's Fund of the Nuffield Trust had the title Social Care for Older People, Home Truths. I think it's interesting that it's, in its title it had Home Truths. And it added to what we already know is a very worrying picture for the future of social care. Obviously in terms of numbers we know that people are living longer, that demand continues to increase for social care, and that people aged over 85 are the group most likely to need care and their numbers are projected to rise sharply in the coming years. But we also know, don't we, that the gap between need and funding has grown much wider over the last six years. So six years of government cuts to local authority budgets have seen, as, as David just touched on, uh, local authority spending on the care and support needs of older disabled people fall by 11% in real terms. In fact, the number of people getting local authority funded has, has plummeted. David mentioned the figure of 26%. And ADAS, the uh, uh, Directors of Adult Social Services, report that as 400,000 fewer people receiving care. Now, of course, that causes extra pressures on unpaid family carers, and I think that's a serious point. And when I took on the role uh, after Jeremy won last year, um, I added carers to the title of social care because I think we should start to think about carers separately. It's, it's important to think about social care, but now the funded part of care that is delivered by local authorities is now so small, I think we seriously, separately need to consider what carers are delivering. <coughs> and I'll talk a bit more about that later. But the other issues are, are as we know, on the NHS. And I, I think it's interesting the words that are used in reports like the one of the Nuffield Trust. Hospitals have struggled to meet the needs of the older age group in a timely way, both emergency departments and inpatient admissions. And caring for older people in their communities has been hampered by shortages of non-acute beds, community nurses, and overstretched general practice. So we're in that context. It's not just social care that is an issue, but those other vital community resources are stretched as well. And when we, I think it was January before last, um, when I was still a member of the Health Select Committee in the House of Commons, had a, a winter crisis, a <coughs> terrible crisis in January, uh, the... Um, the uh, head of uh, the College of Emergency Medicine sat in front of us and said, we need hospice nurses, we need community nurses, we need district nurses. Well, we, you, we haven't got them and you can't grow them that quickly. So, of course, the most visible manifestation of the pressures on local, uh, health and social care has been the rapid growth and delayed discharges, which gets agonised about a lot. But the real issue is those tour cuts, and there's no getting away from that in the face of growing demand for care. And I do now share what, uh, what David has touched on, real concerns about the quality of care uh, at home and in residential and nursing homes. Because I believe that providing care to all the disabled people should be a valued role within our society. But the truth is that it isn't. It isn't valued. We don't value it. Um, the care sector still struggles with low levels of pay and low levels of skill among care staff. Last week, a group of care workers opened a case to sue the care provider they work for because they were only being paid £3.27 an hour, and Unison is supporting them to take that case. Given the hours that they were required to work, they were required to be on call 24 hours a day and were not able to leave the people they were caring for. I don't know how many of you saw it, but in April, a Channel 4 dispatches programme showed just how poor home care can be. Uh, with time clipped from care visits as a matter of course, Care workers working very long days and not being paid for travel time. Care needs being neglected because of those issues with, uh, with care staff. But importantly, and other um, organisations like Alzheimer's have referred to this, no time for the care worker to, to talk and listen to the person receiving care. Absolutely crucial part of delivering care, particularly to people with dementia. So the care sector has a turnover rate of 25%. That's one for us to think about, isn't it? Even when a care package at home is arranged, high staff turnover makes it much harder to build familiarity and trust with the person needing care. And in terms of skills, 37% of care staff have no recognised qualification. And it is worth thinking there's separately been reports on the levels of migrants within care workers. David said we need 275,000 extra people to work in care to meet the needs of that um, growing aging population with care needs. 
what we have to face after June the 23rd is that we may be losing the EU nationals that work in our care sector, and there are 191,000 of them out of all the people who work in care. So if we lose the EU nationals, if we put other controls on migrants, we have a very, very serious recruitment problem in the care sector. And of course that could happen. And I've asked questions about it in the House of Commons and not had any assurances whatsoever. Theresa May won't make assurances either about care uh, sector staff who are EU nationals or NHS staff who are EU nationals. So, of course, in terms of, of that low-pay, low-skilled workforce, the introduction of the so-called national living wage was welcome for the care sector. The problem, as we know it, is that the government didn't provide funding for it, so in effect they've just added to the pressures on local authorities and the care sector. Now, the LGA estimated the costs of the so-called national living wage is at least £330 million a year for home care and residential care providers, but there was no additional funding for that in the budget, and the government ignored what were perfectly reasonable pleas from the LGA and ADAS to bring forward at £700 million for the Better Care Plan. So, weirdly, what the government has done, I mean, every time I ask about it, the Care Minister or Jeremy Hunt would say, uh, we're putting £2.5 uh, billion extra pounds in. Well, they're not. There is no extra money this year and there is only £100 million next year. So, um, local government and the care sector are struggling with that. Now, of course, they brought in the government brought in the 2% social credit precept on council type, but that's not the answer to funding what is effectively a government policy change. My local authority, just to give an example, Salford City Council, needed £2.7 million to pay for the minimum wage increase in our local care sector, but the council can only raise £1.6 million from that 2% social care precept. So in effect, the government is not providing funding for their own wage policy we have, the Salford Council is funding that, and our council taxpayers are funding that, and that's the case in many parts of the country. And I think there are so many warnings in this, but I think, I think it's very important to heed them. The National Audit Office has warned that national and local government do not know whether the care and health systems can continue to absorb these cumulative pressures and how long they can carry on doing so. Now, I could go on, but you know, I, I'm aware it can get very miserable, and I've done this in lots of debates <laughs> and settled in Parliament. But I, as the Shadow Minister of Older People, Social Care and Care, as I said, you know, I, I did spend much of my time in debate after debate after debate, in session after session after session, raising these things. And I find it also worrying that that really excellent report from the Nottingham Trust recently says <coughs> the evidence on the relationship between changes in public spending on social care, the quality and quantity of services, and the impact on the health and well-being of people who use them is extremely limited. We don't even know what the real impact of that is. We do know something about the impact on carers because that's reported on by Carers UK and Age UK. We know in fact that more people are already providing more care for more hours than ever before. 1.4 million people now give more than 50 hours of unpaid care a week and that number is rising faster than the increase in the number of carers overall. So there has been an increase in, of 25% in the numbers of people caring more than 50 hours a week in the past 10 years, whereas the actual increase in the number of carers is only 11%. So they, they're more carers all the time, which they need to be, but they're caring for much longer hours. They're carrying a much heavier burden of care. And the number of older carers is also increasing. Age UK has found that one in seven people over 80 now provides unpaid care to family and friends. And in the last seven years, that number has increased by 40%. It now includes 417,000 people in their 80s providing your paid care. So, we come back to the question, what's the future uh, for social care? In our manifesto in 2015, we said, we will integrate health and care services into a seamless system of whole person care. We will make sure vulnerable older people, disabled people, and those with complex needs get a single point of contact for their care and personal care plan. That wasn't a great set of commitments, actually. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we said, and it wasn't a great set of commitments. But we did make some commitments to carers. But now, even one year on from when we put forward that manifesto commitment, <coughs> we, know, we now know that the social care system is in crisis and it faces a bleak future. So I suppose I want to, as, as I sort of come to the end of what I'm going to say, say, 
Why isn't this causing us outraged? Why are we not outraged by them? I'm outraged by them, but why, why are people generally not outraged? Why are MPs' inboxes not full of complaints and angry demands for improvement? I can tell you I get hundreds and hundreds of emails and letters from people every month about these, but they're not about social care and people don't get angry about it. I do get lots of emails about other subjects. I get things about the internet. There's been an awful lot said about the internet this month about bees and about badger calls. I have a huge following of constituents with real concerns about animal welfare, but I don't have a set of people that contact me about social care. Now, I know before I came into the House of Commons, I did a lot of work with the Princess Royal Trust for Carers, as it was then, and I know that carers, family carers, just get worn down. They're handling a lot of complex issues. They're dealing with the day-to-day. They don't probably have time to think about making a complaint, going to see an MP, you know, think about what they're doing. Um, so I, what I want to say, um, in just ending what I'm saying, is it's back to us, I think. Because now is the time to be outraged. Now is the time to create a plan of. Now is the time to campaign for better funding and more commitment to social care. Um, as David rightly said, um, the when the the previous government uh, social care minister, Alistair Burt, stepped down. There was an article published within a day or two that said social care needs a champion. And in fact, even the government lost its own champion and downgraded the job. We need to be social care champions. I am one, but I can't just do it on my own. So <coughs> that's the question I want to leave with you. How can we get more outreach? How can we get more commitment? How can more people be social care champions? <coughs>